Okay. Hey, join me. Let's go to Revelation chapter 3 this morning. We've got some stuff to, to talk about. Um, and we've been in Revelation. We were there last week, right? But we're in there again this week. And what we're doing is we're kind of shutting down, not kind of, but we are shutting down the series that we've had this summer uh, on focus and on intentionality and on purpose and, and being, living life fully alive, fully grasping the, uh, the, the living Christ and, and being people that are sensitive to His call. We want to hear Him always. That's what we've been talking about this summer. That's, kind of, that's where we've been going. And last week, we began looking a little bit in the book of Revelation, particularly the letters that Jesus writes to the churches in Asia. We li- we've only looked at one. We're going to look at another one this morning. Last week, we were in chapter 3, and we looked at the church in Laodicea, the message that He sent there to that church. And and they had a problem. I mean, they were filthy. They were stinking rich, you guys. I mean, they really were. But they were cold and getting colder. And he says, I'm going to, you make me sick to my stomach. I, I, I wish you would rather, rather you be cold or hot than just lukewarm. And I don't know that he really meant that he would rather have them cold. Could he have actually meant that? Maybe, maybe that was just to highlight the horror of their, of their situation. By the way, their problem was not money. The problem was not wealth, right? It was, that's like saying spoons cause obesity right? It doesn't do that. But it's the comfort that blinds us. And we think we're somewhere that we're not. We are something that we're not. And he says, look, you guys, you got to stay connected to me. You got to stay connected to me. Now, this week, we're going to look at the church in Philadelphia. It's the sixth church that he actually writes. And Philadelphia is located about 43 miles northwest of Laodicea, but about a million miles north of them in terms of passion and fire and intensity and in focus He didn't have anything bad to say about the church in Philadelphia. Nothing to correct. But he's got some things that he wants to say to them. And so that's what we want to look at. And by the way, we're going to look there because he's not just writing to the church in Philadelphia. Right? Remember what you see at the end of every one of these letters. Also, it's here in the church to Philadelphia. It's in verse 13 of Revelation chapter 3. It's written to all of us. Hey, anybody that's got an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. So there's a message there for you and me as well to this church in, in Philadelphia. Uh, Philadelphia. There has been a city there since about 159 B.C. Isn't that amazing? Uh, it's not always been called Philadelphia. That's the name of it when Jesus wrote his letter through John, right? But it's not always been called that. It's had a lot of different names, actually, because that uh, town was constantly being destroyed and then rebuilt and destroyed and rebuilt and destroyed and rebuilt. And it wasn't destroyed by invading armies. It was destroyed by earthquakes. They, Philadelphia is built on a fault line. And every time Rome would come in and rebuild that city, the emperor would rename that city. Yeah. So it had a lot of names. Right now, by the way, there's still a town there. Alahir is what it's called now, if I pronounce that correctly. Don't get too close to me when I say that. Alahir. Okay. But that's the name now. It's had a lot of names through there. These guys. Now, names back to those guys in those days, it meant a lot more to them than it means to us right now. Okay. But names were important. The name of the city right now is Philadelphia. But they were kind of going through an identity crisis. Because you always had these names, and every time they turned a corner, there was some more damage and devastation and renaming and all of that sort of stuff. And there's a message here in this letter to these people. Uh, He's saying to them, listen, the time is coming when you don't have to ever move again. You don't have to hide anymore. You don't have to evacuate. You don't have to leave. You don't have to build up, board up, pile up, or rebuild ever again. Because I am bringing to you, and you are a part of, an eternal unshakable kingdom and we don't want to ever ever let go of where we're going so he says here's the deal here's the deal i'm going to give you a new name he says so let's kind of take a look let's break it down let's look at what he's saying here uh, in this letter and then let's do some take-homes all right like we did last week i think that's a really good way to look at these letters and to end our series so uh, i'm starting in verse 7 here of revelation chapter 3 To the angel of the church in Philadelphia, right. And we saw last week, the one that's doing the writing is the Apostle John. He identifies himself in chapter 1. He's been exiled to an isle, the Isle of Patmos. And uh, it's on a Sunday, and God is giving him these messages, okay? So he says, These are the words of him who is holy and true, the one who holds the key of David. What he opens, no one can shut, and what he shuts, no one can open. I I mentioned to you last week that he identifies himself, Jesus, that's Jesus, right? He identifies himself differently in each of these letters. It depends on what's going on in the town that he's writing. All right? 
Here he says, I'm the holy and true one. Holy. I'm the sanctified. I'm the pure. I'm the set apart. I'm the untainted. You don't have to worry about my judgment. It's holy. And I am true. Several words for true in the New Testament. This one means, I am substantially real. That's really what it means. I'm the one that you can count on. I'm the one that you don't have to wonder about. And he's saying that because they're having trouble in Philadelphia with a bunch of Jewish people who have not yet gotten the memo that Jesus Christ, the Messiah, has come. And they're causing them all kinds of trouble. And they're saying, you guys are on the wrong path. And Jesus is saying, let me tell you what. I'm the holy and true one. I'm the one that holds the key of David. Do you remember? It was through David that God said, I'm going to make an eternal kingdom here. It's going to be through you. As time wore on, the prophets began to realize, well, it's not going to be an earthly kingdom. And it wasn't. It was a spiritual kingdom. And who is a descendant of David? You know the answer to that already. It's Jesus Christ. And he's saying, these guys that are down here that are still hanging on to this old form, he said, they've missed the boat. I am the one that has the key of David. I am the authority. I'm the, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Isn't it a comfort to be able to come together in this room uh, this morning and know that you've surrendered your life to the one who has all authority and all power in the entire universe? He holds the key of David. And he says a little bit later on, everybody else is a liar. He's pretty straightforward, but you'll discover that about Jesus. The longer you're in a relationship with him, the more you come to realize that. So here's what he says. I know your deeds. By the way, he said at seven letters he writes, in five of those seven letters he uses those same words, I know your deeds. In the other two, he doesn't say I know your deeds, but he says I know. I know what's going on where you are. That's what a good shepherd does. A right? shepherd knows what's going on with the flocks. He says I know, and he began to list some of those deeds. He says here it is, I know your deeds. See, I have placed before you an open door that no one can shut. Underline that. Sentence, if you've got your Bible with you. I have opened up a door that nobody can shut. That's what you do when you're the gatekeeper. That's what you can do when you have all authority and all power and all might is yours. I've opened a door. Nobody can shut it. Then he says, I know something about you. I know that you have little strength, yet you have kept my word and have not denied my name. Right in that passage, you get a real picture of what, he really, what he's really looking for in us as a church and in you as an individual. It's not a lot of resources. Whether you've got resources or not, no big deal. He says, I know you've got little strength in terms of numbers, probably, in terms of, in terms of influence against these pagan and Jewish oppositions that they're facing. And all that stuff doesn't matter, he says. You hang on to my name. You stand on my name. You have not denied me. You've stood firm. Man, that's powerful. That's potent stuff. Stay right there. Keep doing what you're doing. Keep doing what you're doing. He says, verse 9, I will make those who are of the synagogue of Satan. Now, who is that? That's the Jewish opposition, right? Pretty derisive term. Synagogue of Satan. Who claim to be Jews, though they are not. Aren't they, weren't they Jewish people? Weren't they descended from? Yeah, yeah. But you see, real Israel is a spiritual kingdom. You and I are parts of spiritual Israel. We're in there, right? We're God's kids. And he says, these guys that are still hanging on to the old stuff. Now, they claim to be Jews, but they're not. They are liars. I'm going to make them come and fall down at your feet and acknowledge that I have loved you. God, there's a picture here of Jesus that's sort of, I don't know if that fits your, kind of your structure or not, but he's, he's, he's painting himself as an avenger, isn't he? It's an avenger. It's a little bit like, there's a movie I watch every year or two, Pale Rider. Anybody familiar with it? Be proud. Do you stick your hand in there if you see Pale Rider? Yeah, I love that. You know, it's, it's, it, the guy comes to town. It's a Clint Eastwood movie. He comes to town. His name is Hall, but he identifies himself as the preacher. Real kind of a mysterious guy. He comes to, it's not really a town. It's a bunch of gathering of tin panners who are panning for gold. And they're the big, bad corporate guys over here that are stripping the mountains. And they're, they think they're all that. And early in the movie, some of the five or six guys that are really tough, they come up there because they're going to show Clint Eastwood how, they, you don't show Clint Eastwood anything. Do you know what I'm saying to you guys? They come up there, they're going to teach him how it was, and he takes an axe handle. Do you all remember this scene in the movie? He takes an axe handle, and he just beats the fire out of those guys. I mean, and they are, he shows them what's what. And he says in typical Clint Eastwood fashion, he says, I love a good piece of hickory. 
You don't know what I'm talking about? And he throws it in the back of the window. You're just going, yeah, because there's a part of you. You know, it's not, we want to see wrongs avenged, don't we? We want to see injustice. That's what, part, that's what anger is. Right? That's the heart of anger, injustice. And he says, let me tell you what's going to happen. I'm going to come, and these guys that say they're all that, they're going to fall down at your feet. It sounds a lot like what Paul says in Philippians 2. When he talks about Jesus, this coming one in the kenosis hymn there, and at the end of that kenosis hymn, he says, starting in about verses 9 through 11, he says, Jesus is coming back. He's coming back, and every knee on heaven, in heaven and on earth and under the earth, every knee will bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. That's his new name. To the glory of the Father. Let the church say amen again. That's what he is. Now, you know why he does that? Because he is El Yeshuati. That's a Hebrew. I'm probably not pronouncing that name accurately. You don't care. I could say he's El Rigamaroki, and y'all would know. So Mark knows Hebrew, right? That's what you would say. El Yeshuati. El is a Ugaritic term for God. Yeshuati is a term that describes what kind of God he is. The root word is Yeshua. Jesus. Hebrew name for Jesus is Yeshua. It means salvation. It means deliverance. It means conqueror. He says, I'm going to make all things right because I am El Yeshuati. Listen, we don't probably have time to do this because I was going to cut this out of the thing. But take a look here real quickly back at, back at Isaiah chapter 12 where he uses that term. Surely, verse 2, surely God is my salvation. I will meet and I will trust and not be afraid. Did you get that? He is El Yeshuati. God of salvation, the God of deliverance, the God of... Con so whatever happens, I'll trust and not be afraid. The Lord, the Lord is my strength and my song. He has become my salvation. Now here's what's really potent about that. It comes on the heels of chapter 11. It's still a part of chapter 11. You've got a chapter break between 11 and 12. But this is a song of praise because of what he says in chapter 11. Chapter 11 is one of the stoutest messianic uh, passages in the entire book of Isaiah. And you don't have this on your screen, but look at this just for a minute. Think about this. A shoot will come up from the stump of Jesse, and from his roots a branch will bear fruit. The Spirit of the Lord will rest on him. Who are we talking about? Yeshua. Jesus, right? The Spirit of wisdom and of understanding, the Spirit of counsel and of power, the Spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord. And he will delight in the fear of the Lord. In this business of judging, this business of avenging, he says he'll not judge by what he sees with his eyes or decide by what he hears with his ears, but with righteousness he will judge the needy. With justice he will give decisions for the poor of the earth. I mean, it's going to be, look, he's coming to make, to make right what needs to be made right. But his kingdom... His kids, us, look at how he describes that. The wolf will lie down with the lamb. The leopard will lie down with the goat. The calf and the lion and the yearling together. And a little child will lead them. On and on he goes. A child will sit next to a viper's nest and put his, put his hand into the viper's nest. No harm will come to him in all my holy mountain. Verse 9. For the earth will be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. And then he starts talking about the fact that well, we've got a little matter with the Assyrians that are coming down the pike. They're going to cause you some trouble. And after all of that is over... Isaiah says, Whew, surely, El Yeshuate, God is my salvation. I will trust and not be afraid. Where the Assyrians come, because something big is happening here. God is a God of bigness. He's a God of awesome, right? Because of El Yeshuate, I will trust and not be afraid. The Lord, the Lord is my strength and my song. He has become my Yeshua, my salvation. So, here you are. Verse 10 of Revelation chapter 3. He says, something's coming. Something's coming to you guys. Since you have kept my command to endure patiently. By the way, if we're going to take home a command today, here it is. Hang on. Endure patiently. I will also keep you from the hour of trial that's going to come upon the whole world to test those who live on the earth. Something's coming. Nobody knows what exactly Jesus is making a reference to here, but something's happening. Something's about to occur, and he says, don't you worry about it because I'm El Yeshuante. Now, don't think that he meant by that that they wouldn't suffer. 
Because you've got the same kind of thing in the book of Ezekiel. Babylonians are coming. Babylonians are coming. And I'm going to deliver you because I'm El Yeshuate. But you know what? A lot of faithful people died in that. What's he saying here? I've got it. It's, it's under control. I've got it. We're not just about right here. We're about something eternal, something meaningful. And there's more to you than what's just here right now. See? Same kind of imagery that Jesus uses in Matthew 6 when he says, you remember he's talking about the Lord's Prayer? And he says, here's, what you, here's how you pray. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Does that mean that, that we'll never be tempted? Well, of course not. But what it means is, is that we'll be delivered out of the middle of it. Out of the middle of it because he's El Yeshuate. He is conqueror. He is deliverer. He is savior. And he says, I'm going to take care of you. So he says, you guys hang on. And there's three promises here in verses 11 and 12. I'm going to come. I will make and I will write. You guys see that in those two verses? I will come soon. I will make you a pillar in my temple. You'll never have to leave, he says in verse 12. Man, that's meaningful to these guys that are changing addresses every few years because of earthquakes and tremors and a shaky earth. He says, let me give you a real foundation. I'm coming soon, so you hang on to what you have. Reiterating that, that, that singular command, I'm going to make you, you overcome, you stick with it. I'm going to make you a pillar. Not only that, I'm going to name you. I'm going to put my name on you. And that's, hey, here's the significant piece of that, you guys. That means ownership. That means I got you. I'm going to put three names on you. I'm going to put the name of my God on you. I'm going to put the name of his city, which is what? The new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven. And I will also write on him my new name. What's his new name? Jesus Christ is Lord. Curios, not boss, not elected official. Not somebody that we're going to debate with the issues about. I am Lord. And that's the name that I put on. You belong to the boss. You belong to that ultimate authority in all the universe. I claim you. Now look. There's a few take-homes that we want to do right here. Okay? Just, just hang on to this just for a second. Because there's a message in that. Somebody saying Mark? Oh, no. It's something else. Okay. I thought Ron Pierce was talking to me in sort of a way and saying, Mark, Mark. Okay, th three, his Bible was talking. It's a living word, you guys, the living word. There's no doubt about it. Three things we're going to take home here. You all ready? About anybody that wants to do the will of God. You want to do the will of God? Personal life, congregational life, let's do the will of God. Three things. First off, one thing that we don't need, clear from this passage. Our resources are not the determining factor. I don't care how much money we have. I don't care how much we got this or that or don't have this or that. Oh, we'd do that if we just had that. What does he say? You have little strength. You're strong anyway. Weak but strong. Problem with Laodicea, they had lots of stuff, but they were so weak and did not. It was the other way around. Which congregation do you want to be a part of? Who do you want to be? So we don't need all that stuff. Some of the things that we think that we need, God will provide. God calls us, God will provide. Anybody want to argue with that? If He calls us, He will provide it if He calls you. But here's the three things you need. It doesn't depend on our resources. Let's get that down. Let's know that. Three things you need. Number one, an open door. A door that He has opened. Right? That's why He says, see it? Y'all see the door? Didn't He say that in verse 8? See the door that I have opened that nobody can close? What doors are he opening in your life? As a church, if he opens it, nobody can close it. Do you know in that little town of Alahir, there's still a church there? Doesn't look exactly like we look. But it's making a testimony of Jesus in a part of the world that's pretty dangerous to live in right now. It's over in Turkey. What door is he opening? Now, here's the thing about the doors that he opens. And take this to heart. Um, you know what happens when you open a door? Flies come in. Flies come in when you open up a door. Open doors, I think, are surrounded generally by flies. It looks problematic. It looks like it's going to be difficult. It looks like it's going to be hard. And sometimes we don't see the door because we're not looking spiritually at the nature of the kingdom and the nature of God. The problems, the obstacles, the difficulties, the flies, if you will. That's not the big 
the big thing. Listen, what door is he opening up for you in your personal life? Kingdom opportunity, door of blessing, door of opportunity. What is he, what's he opening up for us as a congregation? I know somebody in this congregation, the family decided, you know what, we're going to change jobs because, uh, well, here's the reason why. It was lower income, lower pay, but they felt that they could serve in the kingdom better with this other job. I don't know that I would have recognized that opportunity. Hmm? Open a door, flies come in. It just gets difficult. What do you... And see, that's right. Listen, biblically, that, that fits exactly. I want you to think about it as Paul closes out his letter in 1 Corinthians. He's writing to these Corinthians church, the Corinthian church, and he says, I want to come see you, and I want to be able to spend some time with you, but i got some stuff going on in Macedonia. And, and then there's this business at Ephesus. I'll stay at Ephesus until Pentecost because a great door for effective work is open to me, and there are many flies. See that? Lots of flies there. Opportunity may not be readily visible to us unless we are spiritually in tune with God and His kingdom and what we think He wants from us. And look, Acts chapter 14. There's an incredible story that Paul's on his first missionary journey. It's tough. It's a tough journey. And he comes to a place called Lystra. And because of some misunderstanding, they take him out. It's the same synagogue of Satan, same bunch of folks. They take him outside of town and stone him and leave him for dead. Now, when we talk about stoning, I want you to think that they're chunking pea gravel at him. Do you know how they stone people back in those days? They tied them spread eagle to the ground. and They get big, huge rocks. And they would crash it down on their face, head, and chest. If that didn't get him, they'd pick it up and they'd do it again. And they'd do it till he was dead or she was dead. Now, they are a little more, they're, they're not quite as sterilized in their view of death and their experience with death as we might be. They knew when somebody was dead. They stoned him and left him for dead. Then the disciples come and they gather around him and look at that old man, beaten to a pulp. Get up by the power of God. And walk back into town. And all those guys were standing at the bar drinking their cold beer saying, boy, we showed him. And here he comes walking down Main Street. Nobody laid a hand on him then. He goes back into town. And what does he say? Acts chapter 14. Through many tribulations must we enter the kingdom. Through many tribulations, lots of difficulties will be around that door. And when he goes back and reports the whole thing to the church in Jerusalem, he said, you know what he talked about? He talked about the doors of faith that were being opened up to the Gentiles. We've got we to get our vision straight, right? Here's number two and number three together because I need to end this. Faith and perseverance. In fact, they're tied together because you know why you stand up? Do you know why you stand firm? You know what gives you the ability? It's because you believe. How did Paul go from city to city to city, beating to beating to beating, all that stuff, seeing open doors? How did he do that? He says it in 2 Corinthians chapter 4. I did it. We did it because we believe. And he was quoting a psalm. We speak because we believe. Let me tell you what, folk, what do we believe? Is he the holy and true one? Does he hold the key of David? Has he been the bearer of our sin? Is he salvation? Is he actually the one and only Messiah? If we believe, we stand firm. Hang on, he says. Hang on, hang on, hang on. Anybody here ever done any whitewater rafting? Yeah? Did you, why, did you do, why would you do that? Curious. Tommy, why would you do that? Because it was there. It's, it's, it's okay. You know, listen, here in America, the only, you, if, to be legally guided, you, it can't be over a Category 5 whitewater. There's some guys I know of, because I read about, and it's a long story how I got to the blog, but nevertheless, they were whitewater rafting. They went to the Zambezi River in Zambia, Africa, this guy and his brothers, where they're going to float this Zambezi River. The fly, it begins at the base of Victoria Falls. Take a look at your screen. Victoria Falls are the largest falls in the world. Over a mile wide, 300 feet, the water crashes down. The roar is so deafening, 
You can't even, I mean, it's just a deafening roar. The mist goes up. You can see where the falls are on a radius of 50 miles all the way around it. So this guy gets there. They fly to Zambia. They do this. They're going to whitewater raft this. By the way, whitewater rafting on the Zambia Bizi River. It's a Category 7 in the calmer places. It jumps up to Category 8 and Category 9. They get there. And this guy says, i got my helmet on. i got my life jacket on. I'm all, and I'm walking to the raft. And here's the roar of this thing. It's, it's a thousand feet, decline, it drops a thousand feet over a period, I don't know how far it is, down through these narrow gorges. I mean, you know, it's just like, and so as he's walking up to the raft, he says, oh, am I making a mistake here? <laughs> you know why y'all are laughing? Because you've done the same thing. Maybe it's buying a car or whatever it is. There it is. And so he's all decked up. This is, he's thinking to himself, he's thinking, this is safe, isn't it? He's looking at the face of his brothers. They get to the raft. And the guides, because he's got their attention right now. And he says to these guys, he says, Now when the raft flits over. Did y'all hear that? When the raft flips over. And I'm going to be saying, what? He didn't say, if the raft flips over. He didn't say, on the off chance the thing flips over in the water. He says, when it does, he says, Resist the urge to go to the bank. Resist the urge to go to the calm water. He, where the guy used was stagnant water. Resist the urge to do that because there are allig- uh, crocodiles there. Big, vicious, ferocious, man-eating crocodiles. And they will eat you alive. He said, stay in the rough water. Just what he wanted to hear. Here's the message here. Tough to, all kinds of tough times are going to come. All kinds of tough times can be there. Don't move to the edge. Stay with it. Hang on. Hang on. That's what his doors are all about. A colleague of mine that uh, is a big fan of Martin Luther King Sr., the father of Martin Luther King Jr., a number of years ago he went to hear him preach at Ebenezer Baptist Church in Atlanta, Georgia. And that day he was talking about something his mother had said to him and taught him and his siblings. His mother had said, look, no matter what happens, be thankful for what you have left. Sometimes all you can hang on to, see, is kind of what you've got. You hang on. Hang on to what you've got left. Be thankful for what you have left. A few years later, he went back to hear him speak again. This was after his son, A.D., had drowned a few days after his 39th birthday, it was after Martin Luther King had been assassinated. It was after his own wife had been shot to death at the piano in the sanctuary right in front of him. He goes back on that Sunday and he hears him say these words. Be thankful, quote, be thankful for what you have left. Hang on. Whatever it is. Opportunity to serve and opportunity to be blessed. Last week we had Tim and Donna Eller stood up here on this stage. And if you were here, you were blessed by their testimony. Losing a grandson and then losing that grandson's mother. And all that they went through. And I didn't talk to them about the fact that I'm going to say a word here. But I'm going to tell you, you guys blessed my life. You, we saw faith. We saw joy. We saw life from people that were thankful for what they had left. They were thankful, what did they say? For the gospel, and we're thankful for you, and for the God that holds on to us. That's what we're thankful for. What a testimony. I'll tell you something that happened 23 years ago, and then I'm done. 23 years ago, tomorrow, August the 3rd, 1992. In fact, it was a Monday, just like tomorrow's going to be a Monday, August 3rd. This was Monday, August the 3rd. Barcelona, Spain. It was the uh, Olympic Games in Barcelona. And uh, over in the track and field section, the gun had just gone off for the 400-meter semifinal. There was a guy running in that race named Derek Redman. He's fast. This guy is really, really fast. He's trained all of his life for this moment. And about 100 meters into the race... He tears his right hamstring. Doesn't just strain it. Doesn't just pull it. He tears it. It is a career-ending injury. He crumples to the ground. People come out to help him. People come out to do whatever. He waves them all away. He gets up, and he struggles down the track. He is not going to quit. 
Part of the time he crawls on the track. You don't see that in your video. This is an official Olympic Games video. You don't see that in the video. Sometimes he had to crawl across this track, but here he goes down the deal. Now, up in the stands, there's a big guy, huge guy, massive neck and shoulders. He comes down barreling out of that stage. He takes one guy that's trying to keep him from going out there, tosses him to the side, gets out there on the track. It's his daddy. And so they go arm in arm around this track. His daddy right there beside him every step of the way. You know what's going on at home, back home? His mother and sister are watching it on TV. His mother's pregnant. She goes into false labor. His wife, is, uh, his sister is pregnant. She goes into false labor. His mother's crying. Everybody in the stands are cheering and they're roaring and throwing their hats down at this tremendous finish as they go all the way to the end. Anybody tries to help? He says, don't need it. Don't need it. We're going to do this. Do you know why I'm showing you that? Because that's the promise of Revelation chapter 3. El Yeshuate is there. He is there. He will sustain. He will see us through. You may not have a whole lot of opportunities to do something as grand as the Olympics, but let me tell you what. The promise is, church, He is here, He is with us, and He will see us through. And maybe it's a matter of just being faithful, always growing to those last final days, growing, you're spiritually getting stronger. That's holding on. That's hanging on. Maybe it's a matter of Husbands and wives staying together till death do us part. You're hanging on. Maybe it's teens determining to hang on to their virginity in spite of crushing, crushing peer pressure. They're going to hang on. They're going to do what God calls them to do. And, God, and they do it for one reason. Same reason we do anything. Because Jesus Christ is Lord. Jesus Christ is Lord. That's why. For people that hang on to their ministry... Always faithful, always joyful, always loving to people that have those hard, rough spots and still emerge faithfully and joyfully. Hang on as we move through the open doors that God provides. Let's move as we stand and sing. Your light broke through my night, restored exceeding joy. Your grace fell like the rain and made this desert live. You have turned my morning into dancing. You have turned my sorrow into joy. You have turned my morning into dancing. You have turned This is how